Shalom, everyone. I hope you had a great week so far. And again, tonight I have an, what I think is an interesting lesson. It's uh, partially my combination with the work of the Arizal. Actually, he told me some things in the middle of my night dreams. Not, not really, but anyway, I just thought I would say that. It, it, it really, I, I found this one article from the Arizal and I just ran with it. Kind of like what Rob did with the uh, bare sheet when he went and created three parts. I, I couldn't, I could have made three parts out of this, but I decided I would keep it all together in one part. So the, the, the title of the lesson itself is called A Tower, A Statue, and Dry Bones. Now, everybody understands that we're doing Parsha Noach, so they should understand that the, the, the tower obviously is the Tower of Babel. The statue goes from Nimrod or to Nebuchadnezzar, who the Arizal ties Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar together as one being, and we'll get into that. And finally, the dry bones deals with the blowing down of the statue. And that's in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, I can't read all of it for you. And so I'm going to talk my way through much of it. But at the same point in time, I want you to, to begin to, to dig into the dialogue itself. Now, to start with, I want us all to look at Genesis chapter 11, the first few verses, if you will. I'm not following exactly my, my notes, but if anybody would ever want a copy of all of my notes, I'm more than willing to send them out to you. Um, there's no charge. I just put it in an email or text file and send it to you. Helps you maybe, because sometimes I just don't have time to get through all of my, my notes. And sometimes I skip a part that you may think is more important, and hopefully I've given enough information to help you find the answers that you're looking for. But let's go to chapter 11, okay? So it begins, and I want you to key in on some of these words because they're going to pop up as we study Daniel and as we study Ezekiel. We begin with the whole, the whole, Hallel. The whole earth was one language, one, and a common purpose. Now it came to pass that when they migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. Again, coming from the east, they're coming from the mountains of Ararat. That's where, Mo where Noah's ark landed, not on the Mount of Ararat, but in the mountains of. That's an important distinction that you're going to have to understand because the, the ark has been seen on multiple occasions and has been studied and is far different than the ark that's in Cincinnati. But anyway, let me go on. So it, it goes to the fact, it says, and they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them in fire. Now the bricks that they're burning in fire, he goes on to say, and the brick served them as stone and the bitumen served them as mortar. Bitumen is an asphalt. So they're going to use bricks and asphalt to build this structure. And they said, come here. Let us build us a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed across the whole earth. Now, Hashem descended to look at the city and tower. Now, the city's not finished. The tower is not finished, which the sons of man built. And Hashem said, behold, they are one people with one language for all they for all this they begin to do and now should it not be withheld from them all they proposed to do so the purpose is important come let us descend and there confuse their languages or their language that they should not understand one another's language so he's going to confuse their language they all spoke the same language and for your understanding, they all spoke Hebrew. That's the language that was common in those days. From the day of Adam on, the common language has always been Hebrew. It's not until this point that we create multiple languages. Now, 
I have to preface that with an understanding. You and I speak English here in Texas and Indiana. The Texas English is a little bit different because of y'all. We also know that there's Cajun English. We also know there's lots of other styles, but they're all English. That's the Hebrew language. And so all of these people are going to have this common language. Now, and Hashem dispersed them from the there over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. I don't have time to go into it, but understand, Abraham did not live where the tower is at. Abraham came from the other side. In fact, the, the science tells us that he came from the area of Aram, that he lived in the city of Kutite. And there's a whole lot of information that you can go find, but I just wanted to give you an understanding. Not everyone lived at the tower. There were groups of people that lived all around, but the tower was the place where this focus is happening today. So please understand that. Eventually, when we get into chapter 12, we begin to talk about Peleg. And Peleg, it's during that time that the continents divided, land began to separate. So we begin to see not only a shift in languages, but we're going to see a shift of area, which will cause even more dialogues. So that's what's going on. So he goes on to say, and they stopped building the city. And that is why it is called Babel. Understand the word Babel. That is another key word. Because it was there that Hashem confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, Hashem scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So this is our story. Or this is where we begin our story. But there are many key points that I, I really want to spend some time talking about. So we're going to talk about, obviously, the tower. Because that's the significant event at this point in time. But I want to introduce us to Daniel chapter 3. Because Daniel chapter 3 and our event here both occur in the same area. If we remember when Saddam, who was insane, Saddam Hussein, who was in charge of Iraq, he decided that he was going to rebuild the city of Babylon. Now, by rebuilding it, he's living in Baghdad. On the outskirts of Baghdad is the Hillel, the hill by which the Tower of Babel was built. We're in the, what's called the Dura Valley. So the story of Daniel 3 and the story of the tower occur in the same place. Not only do they occur in the same place, but so does the story in Ezekiel 37 of the dry bones. All three events occur in the same place. Two are distance by time. We know that the distance between Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar are centuries. But the difference in time between the tower or the statue that, that Nimrod is building and the dry bones are the same night. The same night. They're not different. And that's the clue that I want you to understand how all three of these begin to tie together. And like I said, if you want my notes to get a, a, a rerun of, of the story, you can just get my uh, email address and, and it's steveambrani at gmail.com. And it's spelled just like my name, only it's not capitalized anywhere. So anyway, let's go back to the story. So in chapter three of the book of Daniel, Nimrod decides that he's going to build a statue. Now this statue is supposed to be 60 feet or 60 cubits, which is actually 90 feet. And the width of the statue is only going to be nine feet. Now, if you understand mathematics, the structure is too tall for the width of the structure. And so therefore it constantly will fall on his face. Now, in order to keep that from happening, and since they're building their, this tower or the statue on uh, sandstone, Nebuchadnezzar decides he needs to weight it down. And since he's building the entire structure with gold, because he took this gold from Israel and from Jerusalem in the Temple Mount, he decides that he's going to use all the gold that he, takes, he had taken from 
uh, Jerusalem to build his statue's base upon which it's going to stand. Now, if you go to the um, book of Ezekiel, and this is for reference, Ezekiel 719, it says, the gold will be for an object of disgust. So Ezekiel identifies this gold in chapter seven, and it's going to recur when we get back into chapter number 37. I want you to understand the word of God says by Isaiah, here little, there little, the word of God is built. Line upon line, precept upon precept. You're not going to find everything you want in one place. You're going to have to draw on multiple places. And that's what I'm trying to do tonight is to draw on multiple places for you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar not only wants to be king and recognize this king, he also wants to be God. And that should be understood by the fact that this statue that he's building, he wants all the nations, the world, to gather together so that it can be coronated coronated for him to be not only king, but God. Now, why does he want to do that? Or what is he doing? Well, the Arizal said that we need to understand the name Nebuchadnezzar, because that's not just his name. There's a part in there, Nezer, which does not really, should not really have been attached. It simply means the ruler. Nezer means the ruler. His real name would have been Nebuchad. Nebuchad. And the idea behind that, it, well, I'll get to that later. The understanding then is he and Nimrod are going to be twins. Let me, let me preface it with this. The first letter of both names is a nun. The last letter of both names is a Dalit. These characters are the same character. That's what Arazal is trying to tell us. And he's saying that, he, that Nimrod did not complete his, what he saw to be his task, and Nimrod picks up where Nimrod left off. So that's what we're actually watching in our story as we go through. Remember, this was about how Nimrod wanted to build a temple and a city. That was his goal. This tower would have been a temple, a temple to the sun god. That was what its originally, original idea was. This is about what I would call a ziggurat. And a ziggurat is simply a pyramid-shaped building that goes higher and higher. And I know that, the, that there are pictures that show it as a conal-shaped building and with the spiral stairs and all of the other things. That might be the arc, the structure around it, but the idea is that this is a ziggurat. If we go to, I'm off the subject, I'm bird walking for a second. If I want to look at a similar kind of structure, I would go to Mexico to look at the, at the temples in Mexico. But I probably would also go to Egypt and the pyramids. You see, the pyramids themselves are structures that are built in such a way that they point directly north, not magnetic north, but towards true north. That's where they actually point, all of them. Not one, not two, all of them. If you take the other statue that's there, and that's the Sphinx, and remember the Sphinx has a lady for a head and a lion for the body. Now we're talking about the mazalot. We're talking about the, the zodiac. The statue of the Sphinx, one day a year, literally divides Virgo and Leo. Do you understand what I'm saying? That this is all structure, goes back to Genesis, goes back to what Rod was talking about when he started talking about mazalots and all of those things. That's what we're talking about. So he wanted to build a structure, Nimrod did, that would allow them to now begin the process of worship of the sun god, not God. And again, 
one of the things that will happen is that Nimrod intends to change and become that God. That's what he's working for. Nimrod is doing the same thing in his story. He wants to be God. And so we have all of these characters. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was using the this, this statue in order to subvert God. But if we go back to the, well, let's go back to Daniel for a second and, and try to work all of this story together. Remember, Daniel himself will not be at this event. Daniel will be gone. And there's a reason for Daniel being gone. And so that reason is found in, in the book of Sanhedrin in chapter 93. It's also read in, in the Nimrash Shir Hasharim, also talks about the same thing. And so I'm going to try to combine a little bit both of them. When you get into the, to the 80s, 90s, and 100s in the book of Sanhedrin, you are really looking at future events as well as past. It's going to be an overlapping thing. God uses the same things over and over again. That's why the dates become so important when you read and understand and look at what's in the scriptures. And so here we go. So these three characters, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which we know better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, will be the representatives for Israel at this event, at this calling together of all the nations. They will represent Israel. Now upon them then, falls the idea, do we or do we not bow to the image? That's significant. Do we or do we not? And according to the story, had they bowed, Israel would never have left exile. The exile would have been permanent. And so these three men, and they are not prophets, they never prophesy any event. They simply are students of Daniel. And these three students now find themselves in a very precarious position. They hold title within the government. They're under the, the control of Daniel. But Daniel's not going to be there. So they have no cue to, to follow. And so what does it happen? They go to Daniel before he leaves on his mission. And they ask Daniel, what should we do? Well, Daniel doesn't answer them. All he says is, I want you to go to see Ezekiel. You see, Daniel and Ezekiel are both prophets during the same period. They're, they're, they are amongst the others. So Daniel says, go to see Ezekiel. Well, the three go over to where Ezekiel's at. He's not in Babylon, or he's not in, yeah, he's not in Babylon. He's in a city outside that. And so they walk to where he's at, and they ask Ezekiel, what should we do? Ezekiel then tells them, well, Isaiah told me that it's best to just simply flee. But they couldn't flee. They wouldn't flee. And so Ezekiel leaves the room, and later he comes back, and they're still there. And he says to them, understand that your God will not protect you. Now he puts a greater burden on the three men because now they know God is not going to protect them. What do we do? Well, it takes us to another story because they began to argue amongst themselves. Well, what, well, what do we look at? What, what events can we use to help us understand what to do? And so they went back to the book of Exodus, back to the story of the frogs. You see, the frogs way back when, when God had Moses go and talk to them, he told them the frogs are going to cover the land. Well, they did cover the land. In fact, as they covered the land, they even went into the fire. They even went into the food, into the crock pots, into anything. But the fire was the most significant event because you see, they understood that if they choose not to bow, that their life expectancy was going to be very short and their punishment would be a fiery furnace. That's what they understood. And so the men came back prepared for that story. It's the same story that's going on today. 
because there are many that find themselves not in a fiery literal furnace, but they find themselves in a situation where they are looked upon like frogs. Now, I, I want to read a section to you because I, I don't want to make a mistake and, and give you some words that are wrong. In my notes, if you have my notes, it's on page four. It begins by saying, God set up the workings of the world such that ideally his beneficence flows primarily and directly to the forces of holiness and goodness. And in order for that to have what they need to carry out their his purpose. So God flows energy, which we call Shefa in Hebrew, energy to the good side. Now, Nebuchadnezzar hoped to use that statue to receive the beneficence and the 70 celestial princes, because remember, every nation has a prince or an angel over it. And he was going to use the statue almost like a radio tower to collect the information, the Shefa from God and bring it down and to use the 70 angels the 70 princes for his purpose, because you see, he wanted to be God. So it goes on to say, I go on to say, only a residual fl flow of beneficence, beneficence reaches the forces of evil now, just enough to keep them in existence so that they can fulfill the role God has placed for them here. Do you hear what I'm saying? Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. We have a God who gives us greater energy than an evil man can put up against us. Certainly he can kill our bodies, but just as certainly he cannot kill our spirit. That belongs to God, and there's great energy flowing. Right now we're in a world, as the Sanhedrin speaks in the end days, when what we will find ourselves facing is gr the greatest amount of evil possible. That's what's really going on now. And it's not going on in just the United States, it's worldwide. Every place is suffering under the same kind of understanding. Well, anyway, evil is also, also does not receive its life force directly from God. Rather, each nation receives its divine flow via the celestial, spiritual, archetypical angel, who is called a prince. God shares and distributes his power to other celestial beings as he sees fit. That's why some nations rise and some nations fall, depending on the amount of energy God gives to that nation. Now, I can give you chapter seven and eight, and I can talk to you about all of the rising empires and falling empires, but that's not for tonight. Sometime I think I would like to teach, and I think I've talked with Rod about teaching the book of Daniel for those who do not have not studied it, at least have studied it in a Hebrew kind of a text. Well, anyway, let me go on. In our story then, Nebuchadnezzar has already brought two different dispersions to Babylon. The first dispersion brought Daniel. Later, he brings with him Ezekiel in the second flow. And Ezekiel and his people are found out in the desert. Now, as he goes through, as we go through this understanding, he not only brings with him those things, but he brought all the gold. And he also brought the vestments of the priesthood. Now, why that is important is because of, the, of that thin crown, that band that goes around the head of the high priest on his turban. That band is the band with God's name upon it. And what he's intending to do with that is he puts it into the mouth of the statue. You see, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know Hebrew. Remember, the languages are distorted back at the point of the tower. And so Nimrod calls upon that that plate in the mouth of the of the statue in order to call order to worship that's what's going on at this particular point in time everyone has gathered shadrach meshach and abednego if you will are standing there with everyone else as everything is about to happen 
And as the command to go to bow to the statue, a giant wind will come up. Now, the question is, where did the wind come from? The rabbis say that was the wind that occurred in Ezekiel chapter 37 over the dry bones. You see, the story of the dry bones is also from the Valley of Dura. All of it is from there. Ezekiel goes to this valley because the Spirit of God lifts him and carries him there. And he stands over all of the things that are going, all the dry bones. Now, some people say that that's just simply all the dry bones there were because of the flood. Everything floated down into Shinar, down into this valley. Now, according to the Jews, this is where a massive amount of Ephraimites found themselves murdered by the Chaldeans. You see, there in the story of, of, of the Exodus, before the Exodus actually happened, Moses had created amongst the e Ephraimites, why are we still here? And they left 100,000 of them to 600,000, according to the story, left and went on home. Some say the Philistines chased them to Dura. No, no understanding of how that happened. But the understanding is that there was something that was a major happening. And so our character, Ezekiel, is over and watches. And we remember the rest of the story, don't we? We remember the fact that he's asked, can these dry bones live? He said, well, it's up to you. In other words, he did not affirm with faith that these bones could come back together, that the spirit of God could enter into them. But he deferred. Remember Adam back in the beginning? He deferred to say that he was involved. It's her fault. Do you remember Cain says, I'm not my brother's keeper? Do you remember the stories of Hezekiah? Hezekiah was supposed to get married, but he chose not to because he knew what was coming. And so all of these characters have the same thing in common. They all deferred. Now, in our story, then, Ezekiel's deference is going to cost him the opportunity to return back to Israel. He will die in the land of the Babylonians, and he'll be buried there, not back in Israel. Well, anyway, that's, that's the story. Now, what happened in this story, once God began to form the bones, he also created a wind that came out of the north and circulated. Now that wind then moved. Now the, the, the idea is, is that anything from the north is a prophetic event. So prophetically, this wind comes from the north and knocks the statue over, but not before Nebuchadnezzar sees all of them bowed except the three men. So in our story, then, we got to go back to the understanding of now what's going to happen. So in the days in which Babylon existed, they had multiple religions, and there was a religious deferment. Only God or the king could nullify that religious exemption. And so Nebuchadnezzar now was put in a conundrum. Do I defer them? And they didn't follow the orders. No, I can't defer them. I'm going to have to do something about it. So what does he choose to do? I'm going to put them through the fire. But first, I'm going to ask them the question. What's the question? Why will you not bow down? To which they answered, we only bow to the one true God. To which Nebuchadnezzar, trying to become God, what does he say? Heat the fire. How hot are we going to heat the fire? We're going to heat the fire seven times hotter. Now, as we're watching the story, then, we're watching what's happened. And as we watch what's happening, there's an unraveling here. The idea is the fact they've now defied Nebuchadnezzar. 
Shir Hasharim Rabbah 714 says that God was using the Ezekiel event and the boys to affirm himself amongst the people. So Nebuchadnezzar has given them the one more chance. And so he heated the fire hotter. He's had his strongest men take the men up over the, the furnace itself. Now, remember, everything in, in Shinar, there are no trees or very few trees. So everything is made out of a mud brick. And so this kiln that he's looking at is the same kiln that they heat bricks in as they go to build the buildings. And so he begins to get them there. And it's so hot that the men who are guarding the three collapse and the three fall into the tank, into this cylinder. But there's a lot of miracles that are going on at the same time. Now, according to Sanhedrin 92a, there were six miracles that should be understood. One, the floor of the kiln rose up to grind ground level to allow the king to see in. Second, the walls of the kiln were breached. Its plaster was dissolved. The image was overturned on its face. That was by the wind. Four nations, according to this story, were consumed by fire that night. And the last thing that they said was, and Ezekiel witnessed the resurrection on the plain of Dura. Chapter 37, Ezekiel. Now you can see, hopefully, that there's a connection between all three. But let's go back to the Parsha, and let's go back to Nimrod in the tower. Why does God apparently have something that he needs to do? Why is it that mankind is acting the way they are? That seems to be as much a problem for him. We knew that all of the people, no matter where they were, came from Noah and his three sons. The language they came off the boat with was Hebrew. Hebrew was the common language. Hebrew was the common language even before that. Hebrew was the language of Enosh. Enosh is the great grandson of Adam. It was during the days of Enosh that they began idolatry. And idolatry became significant because they began to use the names of God. You see, that was true idolatry. They were now using the names to manipulate nature to manipulate everything. That's crucial to understanding. What we, we see idolatry today, and it's really there. But it's nothing in comparison to what it was at the tower, nothing in comparison to the way it was in the days of Enosh. In the days of Enosh, one-third of the world was flooded. But this time, he does not flood the world. He just simply disperses them allows them to, to go to where they are. Because they knew the mystical names of God. That is key. And not only did they know them, but they used them. They used them. They were familiar with all the various angels and their, their positions and their celestial orders and everything that goes with it. They understood how to control the heavens. Now, with that knowledge, they used in manipulating. Onkelis tells us that in the days of Enoch, mankind began to serve idols, for it means that with the knowledge that they used to manipulate the divine names, they caused divine beneficence to descend upon the idols. So this is way back when, but I wanted to get it across. Now, I want to go back to that very first sentence. Now, if you read that first sentence, it says, the kalel, the whole earth, the whole earth was of safa ahat, one language, and united words. In other words, they all spoke the same tongue. Now, I want to give you a, another hint a gematria. I use gematria just to simply verify what I'm trying to tell you. 
Now, the numeric value of the of the word kalel, meaning one language, is the same value as the concept of uh, whole, kalel. Both of them have the same value. The value is 795. And in my notes, I go through that whole process, but I just wanted to give you that information. Next thing I want to tell you, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. Now, this refers to the idol, the, the building of the sun tower, the, to the tower of Babel. That's what it was supposed to be. Whose top reaches the heavens. Now, this refers to that they wanted to give the idol the ability to channel. So they decided to make it a giant radio tower as tall as they possibly could in order to collect that information. So their intention was that they would force divine benevolence to them. The mastermind was Nimrod. The mastermind in Daniel was Nebuchadnezzar. Both together had the same idea. Now, again, Nimrod, just like those before him, was extremely gifted in manipulating language. Had he not been changed, in other words, had the language not changed for him, he could have controlled the world. Now, the whole thing is the, the same intention was done by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the Arizal noted that the first two letters, or the first letter and the last letter, were the same. I want you to understand as I go through this that, that our story is, is far deeper because behold, they are one people with the same language. They all knew Hebrew. In the end days, in the world to come, that will be the language that you and I will speak. That will become the one language again. That goes back again to the Sanhedrin. I think of Sanhedrin 98. But the concept holds true. So he changed his names. He didn't really change his names. He changed Nimrod so he couldn't pronounce the names correctly. And over time, his names have become lost, except to a select few who now hold the name of God, the true name, the Tetragrammaton, is held by 72 men. Had there not been 72 men living today, everything would collapse. So somewhere in the world, there are 72 men that hold this very special name. Okay. I wanted to get done by 730, but I was close. I got it to 736. I wanted to give everybody a chance to, to if you've got my notes, you might have read them and thought about some things that I might have missed or that you wanted clarification for. And so I'm, I, I'm more than welcome your comments or your thoughts at this point in time. And if you didn't get my notes and you would like my notes, it's my name at gmail.com. That's, that's the way you get a hold of me. It's one word as, as it's written there. And also the fact, if you do that, I put you in my buddies list and you also get my notes for the book of Psalms that I'm also working on. So every lesson that I teach orally, I give it to you so that you can have it. So anyway, thank you for the promo. And so anybody, thoughts?